So today the 18th, Sunday after Pentecost, we are happy again in St. Mary's. In the Epistle, on this 18th, Sunday after Pentecost, is taken from St. Paul to Corinthians chapter 1. Brethren, I give thanks to my God always for you, for the grace of God that is given you in Jesus Christ, that in all things you are made rich in him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, as the testimony of Christ was confirmed to you, so that nothing is wanting to you in my grace, waiting for the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who also will confirm you into the end without crime in the day of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the Gospel, taking the back according to St. Matthew chapter 9. At that time, Jesus entering into a boat, passed over the water, and came into his own city. And behold, they brought him one sick of the palsy, lying in a bed. And seeing their faith, he said to the man sick of the palsy, Be of good heart, son, thy sins are forgiven thee. And behold, some of the scribes said within themselves, He blasphemeth. And Jesus, seeing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? Whether is it, e whether is it easier to say, Thy sins are forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk? But that you may know the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. And then said he to the man sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thy house. And he arose, and went into his house. And the multitude seeing it feared to glorify God, who had given such power to men. Thus were the words of today's holy God. Peter, 
I showed you how Peter walked on the waves. Did he believe in me? So I want you to walk on the waves. Everyone walk on the waves. Show me you've got faith, and I'm going to walk out and sea, and all of you walk on the waves. And if you've got faith, you will not sin. How many of us would walk on those waves? Not very many. So why did he get in the boat? To make it easy for us to cross the sea. That's why he got in the boat. And the Holy Roman Catholic Church is the boat that he built. Now consider the other boat. This boat was built by Noah. And the boat built by Noah had pitch on the outside, pitch on the inside. It had a very strong roof, small windows, and there was a very great storm. Whoever was outside that boat died and perished. Whoever was in the boat was not even in the slightest bit of danger. They were not even remotely dangered because it was not the only boat on the sea. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of boats all over the world. But these boats could not handle the great waves and these boats were not provisioned to last the time. Consider all the ships that were out there at that time. Maybe there were some submarines. Maybe there were boats that survived somehow in 40 days. But they had not the provisions. They had not the strength of the sails. They had not what was required to survive the great storm. And every single other boat, of which there would have been thousands during the great flood, they all drowned and they all died. So what does this tell us about our holy boat? The Holy Roman Catholic Church, the boat built by our Lord Jesus Christ, was not built for Christ. It was built for us. And it was built so that it would be easy for us to cross over the sea. This is the great tragedy of Protestantism. There are so many great evils in Protestantism. But the great tragedy of Protestantism is this belief that I, Jesus Christ, is my own personal Savior. And I directly speak with him, and I can walk on the waves just like Peter did. So walk on the waves. Walk on the waves. And when you walk on the waves, and walk on the waves, Peter walked on the waves, and he was the Pope. Peter walked on the waves, and he was a close friend of our Lord Jesus Christ, closer than any of us. And Peter walked on the waves with a deep love in his heart, with a clean heart. And what happened to St. Peter when he walked on the waves? After he walked and he walked and he walked and the ship was further away and Christ was still further away, he took account of the wind and the waves. He was filled with fear and he collapsed beneath the waves. If St. Peter, the first of the apostles, cannot walk across the waves, and he was exceeding brave and exceeding confidence in God, but if he cannot walk across the waves, we're not going to be able to walk across the waves. God built for us a church so that we can get inside of that holy church. And in that church, there we can listen to Christ speak. We can run a toss in the waves even if Christ is sleeping. Remember when the, when the boat crosses across the waves another time, our Lord Jesus Christ is sleeping and there arises a great storm. But so long as he's in the boat, then everything is fine. And then what do they do? They wake him up from sleep and he stops the storm. He didn't make the boat. He said, don't worry, this boat is not going to sink. Of course the boat's not going to sink. But they were afraid. And the storm was so great. He said, all right, which is more powerful? Is the storm and the sea more powerful than the boat? One of the statements of sacred scripture we noticed is that we notice in the great sea, in the ocean, that there are many thousands of ships, huge ships, ships that were made larger than Noah's Ark. And when they sink to the bottom of the ocean, two minutes after they sink, you cannot find them, and you cannot find the sign of them. The sea has defeated them, and good luck trying to find that ship. So, uh, but this boat is more powerful than the sea. We must remember about our holy church that there is no safer place to be. There is no easier place to live. There is no better place and inside our holy church. And our Lord Jesus Christ does not need the church. He doesn't need the sacraments. He doesn't need prayer. He doesn't need sacrifice. He doesn't need anything that the church provides. He is God. He did not get into the boat because he needed the boat. 
He only got on the boat, and he carefully constructed the boat, and he instructed St. Peter how to put pitch on the outside, how to put pitch on the inside. He instructed the apostles to go throughout the entire world and construct the boat, and go to the entire world and encourage souls to get inside of that boat. Remember also, one of the times, there were so many fish put into the boat, the scripture tells us also, and it was almost sinking. But it never sank. We see the boat of this holy church. It was overloaded and it did not sink. It was met by the great storm and it did not sink. It rides upon the calm seas and it doesn't sink and it finds its destination. And that whoever, however, is outside this boat is in grave trouble. Whoever is outside this boat must necessarily drown because none are as good as St. Peter. And he didn't make it across the boat, across the sea. Now we consider one of the evils of the problem of saying Jesus Christ is my personal Savior. And I believe in him and I talk to him. I've got everything worked out with him. And I don't need a church and I don't need a priest and I don't need confession. And I don't need baptism. I don't need whatever the church provides. I don't need the, someone telling me what to believe. I'll make my own belief. Now what happens? Every individual makes his own individual belief. <clears throat> and those, <clears throat> when they're on the waves, <clears throat> they don't know where they're going. They don't have a mass. They can't see in the distance. They can't, as they're walking across the sea, they can't make a compass to see which direction they're going in. They don't have any helps. They're utterly alone. And to be alone is one of the greatest sufferings in the kingdom of hell. There are many tortures in hell, but the greatest torture is simply being alone. Separated from God, and separated from the neighbor, and separated from everything. This is death. That is to be separated. To be alone. That's the greatest suffering in hell. And the problem of religion, all that it is, when you take its theology seriously, it is just the beginning of hell. But realize that I am alone with God, without anyone else. Now inside of the boat, there are cabins. And there are times when one can be alone with God in a cabin of the boat. There are times when we are with our others, uh, others on, the, on the deck of the boat. There are times when we must go down and work. There are times when we go up and see to the very, very great distances of the mass. There are many different places we can be upon the boat. And in some of them we can be alone with God. But we're always with the others on the boat. And when a Catholic priest is ordained, a young man is about to be ordained a priest, the bishop, as he instructs the duties of the priest, he says, this young man, is he worthy to be a priest? And he asks the assistant priest, is this man worthy to be a priest? He said, as far as human frailty allows, I think he's worthy to be a priest. And then the bishop turns into all the people in the crowd. And they had said just before that, just as in a boat, the captain of the ship and the sailors share the same fate. For if the captain sinks, the sailors sink. And if the captain makes it across to the port, the sailors make it across to the port. And therefore the bishop looks up and he says, since the captain of the boat and the sailors all share the same fate. Let me ask the people here in the crowd, is this young man worthy to be a priest? The rector says he is. I am not satisfied. Do you also say he's worthy to be a priest? If any man knows, any anyone here, man, woman, or child, if they know there is something that makes this man unworthy to be the captain of the ship, because the danger that there will be to the ship if he is a bad captain, then let him come forward now and say why this young man should not be a priest. And if he says nothing now, let him forever hold his peace. We do a similar little ceremony at the wedding. This is why the wedding bands exist. But the fact is that we are all in a boat. And that this boat is a most magnificent thing constructed by God. And he constructed with most gentleness. And he constructed with most care. Why? Because he wants to protect his fragile sheep. He could easily tell us, just follow me in the sea. Follow me across the ocean. Keep your eyes on me. And come on, follow me across the ocean. And when the storm rises, don't worry about the storm. 
And if other sheep sink, don't bother with that. Keep on going. But he built for us a boat. Now, oftentimes we are told in our present crisis, you know, you're disobeying the Holy Father, you're disobeying the Pope. And you're being exactly like the Protestants. And so therefore, if they just did what they wanted, they disobeyed, and that's how Martin Luther went back. And now in the battle of tradition, you're standing up against the Pope and saying, no, we can't obey your new teachings, we can't obey, we can't follow your new sacrilegious Protestant mass, we can't follow your new ways. We must stay with the ways of our ancestors. So you're being like Protestants. No, we're not being like Protestants. Because Protestants say, we don't need the boats. We don't need the sacraments. Except for, remember, there are many hundreds of thousands. Now there are more than 100,000 different branches of Protestantism. More than 100,000. Some of them will accept some sacraments. They almost all accept baptism. And then some will accept other sacraments. Some have Holy Communion, even though it's not the real presence of Christ in, in, in most cases. And that says some, some accept, uh, they, 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 they of course accept marriage. They don't accept all the sacraments. Some accept one, some accept two, some accept three. They each make their own decision what they accept. So in fact, they don't accept what Christ teaches, except whatever they like, whatever they don't like. And it's an individual acceptation. Well, what is it in our little battlefield of tradition? And they say, oh, you're being disobedient like the Protestants. No. Acts chapter 5, we obey God rather than men. What is it that we do? We follow all of the teachings of our Holy Fathers. And that means we accept all of the set of sacraments, and not just some of them. All the doctrines of the church, and not just some of them. And that we follow all the teachings without any exception, and we follow the ways and principles of our ancestors. So that if a Catholic of the year 375 AD was put in a time machine, came here to this Mass, he would recognize everything that has happened. And if he heard the sermon, he would understand every word. And if he read our books, he would know every teaching and believe all of them. But what if a Catholic of 1493, only a few years before Martin Luther did his, his evil act, were to appear only a hundred years later in a Protestant church? He would not recognize the prayers they were saying. He would not he didn't recognize the teaching that came from their mouth. He would not understand what comes from their pulpit. He would say, this is not the religion that I belong to. Because the religion we belong to is the same from the beginning and will reign to the end. And also, remember, in this boat, there's a storm. And the church, church Jesus Christ told us, there'll be many storms. And in the storms, people will be cast out of the boat. Some will die inside the boat. Some will drown in the boat. Because if the water gets in the bottom of the boat, and they don't climb out of the water, some will die inside the boat. Some will die outside the boat. Those who live are those who remain faithful to the rules of the boat. Those who stay within the boat and those who follow the rules of the boat. And these rules are made in order to keep us, make it easy for us to get to heaven. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I murdered my mother-in-law. Say three Hail Marys and don't do it again. It's not that hard in order to be saved. So the fact is that what, is, what happens when we go into, the, into, the, into this holy church we are given every easy opportunity to get across the sea. And there must be a great love of this holy boat, which is our holy church. It is there to protect us and guide us across the sea. And we know that within this boat there will be wicked captains. We know in this boat there will be wicked sailors. We know in this boat, as the Lord said, there will be good sheep and there will be black sheep. There will be good shepherds and there will be wicked shepherds. There will be brief times of a kind of calm, but there will be storm after storm after storm. There will be those that lose the faith. There will be those that stick to it. But those that remain inside of this holy boat, every single one who stays inside the boat and follows the rules of the boat, shall be saved. And there is no easier or better place to be in a storm. When the storm gets really, really bad, and your head hits one side or the other, your head is hitting the wall. If I go out of the sea, I, my head won't hit the wall. No, you'll drown. There are pains that come because you're in the boat. But these pains are wounds and bruises, but they do not bring death. But the pains that come outside the boat bring death. So in order to Christ walked across the sea, says St. Peter Pesarlis, to show that he is God, and also to show that he came from heaven to earth alone. 
but he does not walk back. He constructs a boat. He could have said, I am your personal savior, and I'm not going to give you 12 apostles. I'm not going to give you priests. I'm not going to send you bishops. I'm not going to send you a uh, teaching of our holy church. I'm not going to give you a pope. I'm not going to give you sacraments. I'm not going to build you churches. I'm not going to make Christendom. I'm just going to say, believe in me and walk. So many billions of souls to be damned and damned. And St. Peter, the first of the apostles, wasn't able to follow such a Christ. St. Benedict was a holy monk. But in England, there were many holy monks. There were great saints in England and great saints in Ireland. And they were holy monks. And they were dedicated to penance. So one rule of some of the monks, the English monks, it's winter time. Time to bring a hole in the ice. If we're not having a prime in the morning. We're all going for a swim. And so they break hole in the ice and go for a swim and freeze to death. It's summertime. We're not going to go say Compline. We're going to go in the bushes and we're going to roll the bramble bushes until we're bleeding to death. And it's Lent. God fasted 40 days and 40 nights on nothing. Get used to eating nothing. There weren't very many monks that followed them. They were great saints, each one doing greater penance than the other. But men joined the monastery, and after 37 days of eating nothing, they said, you know what, I think I'm going to go get married. <laughs> and after rolling in the bramble bushes for, for a whole bunch of time, they said, if he can do it, I can. I don't really feel like swimming when it's 40 below zero. It's not on my list of important things to do. Then St. Benedict came, and he followed the spirit of the church. He also was a great saint like those Irish and English monks. And they were great saints. They were given to give themselves to God in a most special way. But they weren't able to make monasteries that lasted. And St. Benedict said, Ora et labora. Let's follow the spirit of our church and the spirit of Rome. Let's pray and work. We don't have to go and jump in the ice at 4 o'clock in the morning. Let's try doing matins. And let us go in the morning, say a few prayers, and we'll go to breakfast, and we won't eat meat during most of the year, or we'll have a simple food, but good food, and enough to keep a monk strong so that he can work in the fields. And we'll have a period of fast, and we'll have feasts, and we'll have time to pray, and we'll have time to work, and we'll have a time of recreation, and we will live our whole life, life unto the church. So the monastery is like a little church. It has walls, like the boat of the church, which is to protect its monks on the inside from the contagion of wickedness on the outside. It has rules, which are to make it easier for the monk to live a happy life, and a peaceful life, with prayer, and with work, and with play, and with, and with sleep, and with all the things necessary, and penance. Look at our penance in the Holy Church. We say often, you must do penance, you must do penance, you must do penance, you must do penance. Father, what penance should I do? I'll drop that fourth dessert. Stick with only three. And then also, what is that great penance? Two small meals, which take a letter, don't, don't, taken together don't equal means more than the major meals. What do you do? Eat a bigger main meal. And then make the adjustments. But then they say, no, you eat a normal meal and two small meals are taken together don't equal more than that. Anyone can do such a fast. The church makes it easy for us to fast. Easy for us to pray. Easy for us to walk away from sin. Easy for us to pass to a star. Our Lord Jesus Christ often sleeps in the boat while we are on the journey. And we must remember that this holy boat of the Holy Church was established by God to make it easy for us to get to heaven. And if there was no such boat, all would be lost. Let's get into that holy boat. Let's stay firm to all the rules that are given to us by our Holy Church. And stay close to our church and thank God for this bride of church. St. Paul says Jesus Christ died because he loved his bride. He loved his bride of church. And so this, this is a living boat. It is a bride. We call her Holy Mother Church. And why do we call her Holy Mother Church? Because the mother loves all. And the mother tries to spring all things into, in, into life. And the mother is about life. And the mother is about healing wounds. And the mother is about protection. And the mother is about making everything good and making everything easy. That's what a mother does. Fathers don't often do that. But that's what mothers do. And our church is a mother. She is a true mother. And we follow her ways. 
And in the greatest crisis in the church, we're in one of those great crises right now. The greatest one will come when the Antichrist comes. Stay faithful to the rules and love of our holy church. And then, then remember, and this is the only way to make it through a storm. Because if you walk in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, Amen.